All right, let me get the uh, let me get the record uh, the recording contraption happen. Brrr. I want very much to ask you about that movie that you saw, Justin Robert Young. I have a lot to say about it. We will save it for the show. All right. I saw it. You saw it as well? Yeah, I, I called him up last night and told him my review. God. Is Andrew's audio really low to you, Brian? Um, not particularly. I could I could turn you down <clears throat> if that was. Is that any help. better? Okay, yeah. No, it was just Andrew's volume relative to yours, Brian. Uh, Durka, real quick in the chat, wants to know if I was born and raised in Texas. Uh, we moved to Houston when I was five years old. And from there on out, I, I spent one year out in Colorado and a year and a half out in Norway. But outside of that, it's all been Texas. Norway, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. By the way, that is, of course, Colorado, Texas, and Norway, Texas, that he's referring to. That's right. <laughs> and Paris, Texas. All right. Yes. Okay, here we go. Press the record. Sorry for the uh, the very last minuteness of me getting the live stream on. I try to be better than that for you guys. Check, 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 check. All right. Let me. Wait. Oh, let me tweet this. Okay. Circus out. So you got that message about that guy who might be there to do that thing. Hopefully, Whoa. yes. Wrong buttons there. Sorry, gentlemen. Here we go. It's okay. uh, in true fashion. It was like, of course, sure. Followed by, here's why it can't happen. Followed by, so, yeah, I'll probably be able to do it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, you know, Brian, when you have, to, you have to schedule for a guy like that, you really have to think like a man who has a busy schedule. What are you doing? I see what you're doing. I see what you're doing. You just got OJ Simpson got parole. Don't, don't don't put don't put our guest on a pedestal, man. I'm just saying, like, keep All it right. cool. All right, I won't. I mean, here he's very much in the weeds when it comes to his uh, <laughs> his commitments. Look, man, what are you, some kind of guru of whether or not this guy is gonna be able to show up <laughs> and see? Yes, thank you. Um, all right, let me stop this. Man, we're ready to go. I'll tell you, for the first time in forever, like, I'm actually in my house. I'm not worried about my internet. I had enough time to do prep oh, for the show soon, by going to... Oh, too soon, too soon. What? What is that? People in New York worried about their internet, and Justin's got to rub it in. Oh, no, no. Although I will, in solidarity with everybody I know in New York, I'll do the show f with my feet in a kiddie pool. <laughs> All right, I think we're ready. Recording? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Mr. Brian Brushwood. Yeah, hello. Lucky I could be here this evening to join you fine people to speak of weird things. Precisely. The other voice you're about to hear is Mr. Justin Robert Young. Ah, wee oui, wee. Oui. Ah, the French... <laughs> Champagne. Have you heard the uh, the William Shatner talking to the radio announcer guy that just came out? I mean, it's been out for a while, but I no. just heard it for the first time. Uh, no, I actually, I, you just reminded me because you sent that to me and I started playing it, but I was, I was in line at Target and then I stopped playing it and I never got back to it. So he, he does a read and then the guy says, uh, can we do it like a little more, a little more energy? And Shatner's like, okay, more energy. And does it again. And the guy's like, yeah. Maybe a little different. And Shatner's like, well, how would you like me to read it? He's like, well, it says, no, why don't you read it so I'll know how to read it? And, and this guy's like, no, no. And he's like, no, I insist, read it. You're right. You know, let me you do it. And he just makes the guy read it. And then he does like a pitch perfect, like not imitating his voice, but hits the guy's pitch and speed exactly as he does it back. Like ultimate then, consummate professional. But, and then the well, guy's like, how was that? And the guy's like, well, no. And it starts cringing because... You know, it's not, you know, one guy's the voice talent. Ultimate one... douchebag professional. Uh, it was, it was, yeah. you always want to be mindful when you work with people who do that for a living, how to, how to ask for things. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think that there is there is a line of certain decorum that you have to have as a director too. You know, it's not I mean, obviously it's easy to just dump on Shatner because we know, you know, more of Shatner and and we have a preconceived notion of who the Shatner is. But I mean, there is there is definitely an element to handle egos. That's part of the director's job. Yeah. Well, this is this is very amusing because Shatner is just in it, it is he just drills into the guy just by insisting, like, no, no, you we will do it the way you want it. You know, <laughs> we will do it the way you want it. Exactly how you want it. Tell me how you want it. And then Yeah. You know, it's, it's worth listening to. So uh We'll do a, let's do a little startup right here with a uh, a detective case. Whoa! Oh, thank goodness, okay. I'm ready Could to be solve the perfect the... crime. What kind of what kind of? Uh, listen, you want those old hacks, Spiro and the Fudge? Uh, don't it, force it, Brian. I'm Jesus. just saying. I'm just saying. There's a new team in town. Whoa. Who's the new team? Is this the spinoff? It's uh, Gary and the Weasel. <laughs> Gary and the Weasel. What? <laughs> <laughs> They're available. We also have. Uh, uh, Lilo and the banana. <laughs> we've got uh, we've got the server and Firestorm. <laughs> they're all Brian's they're all available. And, and Brian's about ready to go. Uh, the router and the beer bottle. <laughs> it's like yeah. I'm, I'm I'm looking around. It's like Wayne's world. I'm like there's um the, oh, empty... the hemorrhoid cream and the <laughs> yes. feet. There's, there's the... John microphone and Herb <laughs> Monitorstein. There's the empty pike glass and the keys. They're ready there for you. So who's it going to be? Gentlemen, you choose. All right. So I need to know. Just knock on the door. I'm going to give you your case. Uh, what was your first one? Gary and the weasel? Sure. <laughs> yes. Uh, all right. Well, you're Gary. Gary. Obviously, I'm the weasel. <laughs> Gary's like a passive-aggressive guy. You know, he was like a former... Shop teacher Magician. decided to become a police officer. <laughs> yes. Former shop teacher. Very fastidious. Very has no trigger finger from a shop accident. Very insistent. Oh, so that's like that's like the big thing. Is like he's like, oh, like Gary, here's the gun. I can't shoot. My <laughs> finger was chopped off in the shop accident. That's what are you mocking me? Element. I like that, and the weasel's like a distinguished English gentleman. We don't know why he's called the weasel. Yeah, the weasel is just like he's like super high class. He's got a vaguely Uri Eastern accent. Okay, so there we go. So Brian, you're. Uh, do you want to be the shop teacher or? I, the... I should probably be Gary now that I think about it. <laughs> All right, so there we go. Uh, I, I I do say, uh, Gary, why don't we knock on the door? Why would we knock on our own door, the weasel? It's well, not like that. Because that, that was the directions we were given to begin this challenge, my friend. Please do <laughs> tell. Fine. I will. You... I will knock on the door, and maybe magically there'll be a case for us. Come in. Wait. This is okay. I thought we were in our office, but apparently we're in front of someone else's office. Well, now I'll try not to act surprised. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go, Weasel. <laughs> Gary, why are you wearing those protective eyeglasses on again? Uh, because one can never be too safe. Then you at know, least clean the paint and sawdust off of them. Uh, no, they're a reminder of what might be. They keep me aware of the the menace. Of, of paint and sawdust. Way to think on your feet, Gary. Uh, good sir, what do you say your issue is, and how might we be of service? I'm sending you over to Eastern Europe to go solve a crime, gentlemen. Ah, uh, I used to summer in Eastern Europe. Are there are there foreigners over there? No, no. Okay, you promise? You pe I'd yeah. say pinky swear, but you'll just remind me that I'm missing the pinky as well. <laughs> <laughs> so that wait, was totally not uh, a shock accident. Uh, was... I, I might not have noticed because you were wearing gloves. You're telling me that you are missing both your trigger finger and your pinky. <laughs> yes, the weasel. Do you want to make an issue out of it? You want to make were, a big were deal? They, were were they cut break? off in the same accident or, or were they rather separate incidents? You, oh, you want to make a carnival sideshow of my tragic past? I'm just trying to, to uh, illuminate. We're, we're partners now. We're going to go solve a crime. Uh, you know right what? Now, we're on a flight, by the way. We're on a flight 
to Eastern Europe. If you, if you want to illuminate, how about you not do it in front of a client? Well, this is after the client. Oh, I'm, I'm actually like <laughs> your cop, so I'm actually like your your boss. How about not in front of my boss? Because we're cops, not <laughs> private investigators. Uh, Gary, why don't you go knock on our own door again? <laughs> so uh, you show up. It's that was charity. a joke. Yes. All right. Got it. Charity's like uh, um, Polish accent. Uh, we have a, a problem. Money is being ripped off from us. Money. Mm -hmm. Money. Currency. How much? Oh, uh, I haven't done a count yet, but it could be a couple hundred Polish dollars. So we're looking uh, at uh, a minor. Slotties, I do believe. Slotties. <laughs> where? Where? Uh, wait, you actually know this because you went to Poland, right? Uh, and I, I am an international man of reverence, my friend. <laughs> Gary, stick with me. We're on my home turf. If we were in some sawdust-laden public institution, then I would say, Gary, why don't you show me the ropes? We're here amongst gentlemen of Europe. Do please follow along. <laughs> so about 200 Zlotties. 200, 200. Uh, that... yeah, and not all at once. Wait, so somebody's, somebody's leeching this money? Yes. Just just yeah, sort of that's... sipping away? That, now, wait, 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 what business do you run? Where are we? What is this place? Well, let me get that. First, we've gone through all of our staff and asked them repeatedly, and we've used some Eastern European Soviet interrogation techniques. Um, of the three that survived, they wait, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I'm it just. <laughs> it's, uh, I only got I only got three fingers here, so you might need to walk a little slow here. You got to slow things down. Uh, those who survived. Well, I'm kidding. I mean, they, they all survived. I, I did gave them a sharp talking to. OK. And uh, nobody will admit to it. Nobody will admit to it. How many people are we talking about? Uh, we've got about seven or eight people who work here. And and this is I'm I'm sorry. I'm not from. Uh, uh, we're we're in we're in Poland, but right, that's the yes. Uh, I'm I'm not a po, so uh, you'll have to explain to me what is this your business does. Well, we're a, we're a nonprofit uh, involved with sort of the uh, uh, welfare, um, animal rights things like that. Anyhow, uh, what we have thought about doing is asking you, uh, you know, what would be the best way to try to catch the culprit. Uh, Tap uh, now, uh, uh, sir, you, 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 you did mention before that this was over uh, 200 Zlotties. Yes, yes, we. Uh, and, and over how long a period was this? It's going on for a couple weeks now. Weeks, you say? Mm-hmm. Ah, we have a long-term crime syndicate afoot, if I'm not mistaken, the weasel. Um, no, uh, it... Allow me to uh, uh, do just a, a wee bit of math here. Uh, we are talking about 200 Polish slutties, which would uh, <laughs> be 62 uh, uh, American dollars. Yes. This isn't exactly uh, the, 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 the great train You're right, the I, I, I do believe that uh, Gary has, has turned a blind eye to do drug deals in his classroom that uh, amounted to a greater transaction. Now, hey, I, hey, listen, big shot Americans, okay? I don't know if you've looked at the economy here. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, uh, look, they, this right, is right. obviously a big deal, so they if hired the best. They hired yeah, if the If you can't best. handle this crime, if I'm sorry, you can go. Apologize. I mean, we're, we're sorry. Sorry for bothering no, you. No, we can handle it. We can totally handle it. We can handle it. And if you also need a substitute next Thursday, we will still be in the area. When I say we, I mean perhaps the one of us who has a teaching certificate. Hint, it's not the we's. Don't worry, good sir. We will have this case solved faster than one of Gary's 16-year-old students can get pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> I, again, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The weasel. Um, and first of all, why do you make me say the in front of your name? Can we just, can, uh, we've known each other for 25 years. Can I just My say- My name is Theodore T. Weasel. <laughs> I just, I just want to say- The Weasel is my nickname from Weasel. uni. Weasel, I've talked to you about this before. We have clients, and when you undermine me in front of the clients, it makes me highly insecure, and it affects my performance. Exactly. And don't worry, uh, Mr. Gary. I have no less respect for you now than when you walked through the door. Well, you're lucky. You're lucky, Mr. The Weasel. 
I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Back to back to he the He doesn't nature. know what that means, does he, Mr. Weasel? No. No, 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 he doesn't. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid, sir, that apparently part of his brain power was cut off when he unceremoniously lopped off his own fingers in a unfortunate accident. Now, uh, you have a situation where uh, several Zlotties have gone missing over a six-week period, uh, and, and what you are involved in, again, is uh, charity or, or welfare of, of some sort. Uh, is that right? That is correct. Well, I think uh, no. it's obvious. Gary, why don't you just go ahead and state what is plainly before us? Uh, well, uh, if you and I are on the same page as we often are, Mr. the Weasel, uh, then I'm pretty sure that we've got a case of, of sexual embezzlement, if you take my meaning. Ah, and you are saying sexual embezzlement to, uh, to mean and be quite explicit. <laughs> well, obviously, 62 American dollars is about what it takes to get an H.J. around the corner, right? So it's obvious that somebody's been saving up, looking for an opportunity, and splurging to splurge. To get a Higgs boson jargon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> is that not it? Do you want to ask any yes or no? Yes. Uh, first of all, no. uh, oh, <laughs> uh, let's uh, let's 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 real quick. Let's uh, let's get real here for a moment. Yes. If you don't mind, gentlemen, uh, you say nonprofit work. Um, is this yes. is this is the nature of this work a sexual establishment? Uh, indirectly. Huh. Uh, is there is there any um, animals involved in your practice? Yes. Uh, is there animal sexuality on display on any level of your operation? Not if we can help it, and only between the animals. Wait a minute. Is this? Do you run a zoo? No. Wait, but do people pay you to come look at animals? Not to look at them. Wait, to touch them? Wait, uh, is this is a petting zoo of some variety? <laughs> no. You may pet the animals, but it's not a petting zoo per se. Wait, is this an establishment where people come to have Stop sexual... Stop trying to do the British accent, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, that's another part of Gary's character I forgot to mention. It's like he really wishes he was the weasel. <laughs> and he, from time to time, slips into trying to do the weasel's accent, but he's clearly unqualified. Um, are you trying to tell me that this is some kind of factory where people are able to have sexual relations with taxidermical replications of animals? You're doing Definitely it again. not. I do what? You're doing it again, Gary. Uh, I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We right spend a lot of time around you. It rubs I'm, off. I'm from it's Wisconsin. Like Madonna it's very Britain. difficult. Uh, now, allow me to help my associate put his finger on the matter. Uh, do you, in your organization, have any kind of illegal past, any kind of uh, run-ins with the authorities in the past prior to now? No, not that I'm aware of. Hmm. That was a terrible job of helping me, the weasel. <laughs> if, if, if you thought that by that question you would eliminate a whole swath of options, then it didn't work. Oh, well, hold on, sir. Uh, allow me to uh, ask it in the manner for which you would. Yes. I, I, Gary from Wisconsin, I would like to ask you a question, sir. Now it sounds quite ridiculous when I do it, now doesn't it? Man, I'll tell you what, man. You, you can, you're like a chameleon. I never get tired of watching that when you pretend to be me. Like in my mind, I pretend that you just actually slide inside my skin and you hold back a couple all right, fingers. Okay, okay, okay. What? Uh, <laughs> why do all of these partnerships always end in very weird homosexual longing? Yes. <laughs> That's a yes no question. Um, okay. Um, when people come in, do they pay? Do they pay expecting to touch something? Not necessarily. They pay. I've, I've solved the case. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, the weasel. I do believe that your missing money can be found. Now, I don't know 
if it will all be there in one piece, but it has not been run off with and spent by scoundrels and brigands. I believe that your money has been et by the animals for which you care for. No. <laughs> Are you sure? Well, then, Gary, you take a shot. <laughs> Uh, it, it, well, I, I would imagine <clears throat> it's it's a more interesting. I'm just still trying to figure out what what the heck your company does. I, I need to zero in on this. Uh, do people? I I don't even know how to phrase. Remember, this... Gary, measure twice, cut once. <clears throat> okay, that's again. If you're gonna bring up '86 again, I've got to remind you that that's not professional in front of a client. That's uh, fine. When it comes to solving crimes, Gary, you're number three. Okay, again, that's not professional. It's just this needling. You're always doing that. Uh, here's the question. Is, is there animal testing going on? Not that I'm aware of, no. What What are you aware of? Why do people come to you? Are you open to the public? Yes. And the people come and they pay you. But it seems like you don't really know... Much of this is a slaughterhouse. Do you run a slaughterhouse of some sort? A slaughterhouse. Uh, not if we can help it. <laughs> okay, again, again with this ambiguity. This is <laughs> getting very difficult. I'm down to my last uh, two ideas. <laughs> uh, man, I, I, I got to tell you, I'm, I, I'm having a tough time. Mr. the Weasel, do you have, do you have any? Wait, is this a breeding facility? Uh, no, the opposite. What, a is neutering? It, so it, is, it, is a, it is a sterilization. It, it is a, a veterinary clinic of some sort. Of a sort. Yeah, so you guys neuter animals? Yes. Like people uh, people that bring in their animals? Or like you neuter your own animals in some bizarre tournament show? Neutered, you say? Like Gary's confidence okay. after he lost two digits from his right hand. I, 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 yes, the, the, the Mr. The Weasel. I, I can't, Gary. We're we're very close. Yes, let's we're... deal with this later. Yes, I am very close to quitting this team. Uh, okay, so uh, uh people <laughs> <laughs> people bring their animals. It's and... an animal shelter. It's an animal shelter. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. <clears throat> and the money all missing. along. <laughs> just as just as we suspected. Just as I have laid out in intricate detail before. You're that that, that <laughs> I was I was this close. <laughs> um okay, so so uh, 60 62 bucks. 200 zlotties, okay? Okay, 200 zlotties uh are was lost. We had it in our cash box. <gasps> bit by bit, gone. Did did it get eaten by one of the animals? Did not get eaten. Wait, did, did, Gary, did you stick the two fingers that you've lost of your hands in your ears when I proposed that exact scenario <laughs> not but five minutes prior to now? Uh, listen, the weasel, uh, there's a lot of things I like about you. And I mean a lot. A lot of things I like about you. Your, your full digits. Your ten fingers, my jazz fingers. <laughs> uh, the fact, the fact that you could do a, a a dashing, smashing American accent. But among the things I'm less than fond of are your constant criticisms. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let me suggest, Gary, you're right. That's my fault. And I do say, good sir, I will mellow out like one of your students who leaves class <laughs> to deliberately get high in full view of the window for which you look out of, almost daring you to do something. Again, I, I, don't, I don't make references in front of our boss to your, say, oh, I'm sorry, look, I'm the weasel. I'll make sure to be incredibly handsome and do everything right all the time. How does it feel when I do it to you, the weasel? Really so good, sir. Uh, it, slowly, bit by bit, the Zlotties were here, and then the Zlotties were gone. Were they smuggling the Zlotties out of the, of the animals? I feel like somehow they went in the animals. 
No, nobody's going into an animal unless we approve it. All right. <laughs> well, then where now, the Gary, go? let's so, not bring your happened. wife into this talking about going into the animals. <laughs> so this this Polish animal shelter noticed that cash was going missing. Money was going missing. They uh, interrogate the staff. They're trying to find out what's going on. Everybody pleads ignorance. So they set up a video camera. And, and what they, do they see discover? I was one of the just about to suggest that. <laughs> they see a cat go into the cash box, stealing bills, not eating them. They follow the cat over to a couch, and under the couch, they find several hundred dollars of Polish money. Are you kidding me? I suspect the cat was planning an escape. It was trying <laughs> it was, to get up was, enough it was money. Stashing a getaway fund. Exactly. It was going to run out with a bribe for the local officials. That's well, uh, gentlemen. It seems as if we've solved this case yeah. of the cat burglar. <laughs> the perfect crime. See, see, you did it. That's you what guys, I said at the very beginning. By the way, you're both you're both so good. You, in fact. I don't know why I'm in this organization with with the way you guys make the puns to sum everything up. <laughs> to our radio I would listener, love a a a his remaining fingers. I would love a mystery show that always ended with uh Somebody, two people making puns, and then somebody else f- trying to very awkwardly fit in. <laughs> <laughs> somebody who's like it is deformed from having taught poorly yeah. in shop class. A cat burger, the perfect crime. You, you can't c- catch him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get, or, or better yet, he makes a pun, but it's just totally unrelated. Like, I guess she had cat scratch fever. Right? And then the money was gone? It, it, well, I'll tell you what will be in your life uh, if you like good music. Better well, call Dr. That's... Bounty Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Justin. <laughs> that would be uh, Rachel Higdon's Brothers Band Midnight Switch. You can go on to Facebook and just search for Midnight Switch. Uh, they're a great Kiwi band. And Rachel wanted to give them a big fat shout out. If you want to follow her lead and sponsor this very podcast, we can do your live read right here on the show. Just go to weirdthings.com slash sponsor. And thank you to Rachel for helping this episode of Weird Things be a little bit more awesome. Yeah. Gentlemen, this week Slate asked a very, very important question. What happened to the weasel? No. Hmm. That is not the question. May I proceed? May I, please? I was just asking what happened. Uh, There's echoes of Gary still in me. It's like it seems like so long since I've seen him. Can I get to the question, (laughs) please? Yes, please. Ask ask the question. This is serious science here, Brian. I'm sorry. Who would win in a fight, a Neanderthal or a human? Neanderthal. Really? So it's just like a physical scrap. Like we're just in, are we talking arena? I Like I've always thought in my mind that the Neanderthals were the superior species, except for they weren't so good at procreating. Like humans had the moves and they were, they were, they were sneaky running around having sex with the Neanderthal women, which is why all of us have one to 4% Neanderthal DNA. And, uh, is that is that not the case? So wait, are we, are, are we talking about? But we're are we talking about peak, like apex Neanderthal versus apex human, or are just like randomly drafted Neanderthal versus randomly drafted human? Well, let's let's say uh, peak. You know. Well, because man, and because, Brian, because also, you're selling us down the river. Oh, you're like man, like yeah, Neanderthal. Hey, buddy, we're all part you're like, of Neanderthal. Need Neander- for me. <laughs> I love Neanderthals. I, look, look, we we all got a little Neanderthal DNA up in us, so it's not like it's us versus them. But I'm going to say that's fine, Benedict Brian. <laughs> why don't you go over there and uh, see if you can get your four percent into into a Neanderthal? But like, like people think that Neanderthals were be all big and muscly, and humans be all tiny and smart. But that's not that's not the case. As 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 I got learned on this show 
that uh, that Neanderthals were 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 smart. They uh, they were able to have uh, artistic representations of things. But uh, but what was the the supposition in the Rational Optimist that um, that the difference was trade? That humans were trading and that we were able to. To, to, to take other people's ideas from hundreds of miles away, and that's why we were able to win, right? Yeah, they didn't deal well with strangers. Right. Uh, so, so it could be, like, that. all of that suggests to me, like, if Neanderthals were able to do as well as they did, and they didn't even have the trade thing going for them, like, how much smarter and stronger and better must they have been? Well, Neanderthal, the average Neanderthal was about five foot five. That's bigger than how how big was a human back then? Well, I mean the average. Uh, I mean, at that period of time, I know the average human right now is five foot nine. Yeah, but we got so, we've we've gotten like way big over the last several. Compared to, we years. have reach. We had we'd have like big reach on the Neanderthal, right? So we'd have reach on them, and we also probably had greater stamina. They had strength, but we had stamina. Yeah. Uh, so you got to yeah, man. Fight. I'm saying you put them. You put us. You know, Neanderthal and a human in, in a Coliseum. I got humans all day. No, 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 no. See, that's just it is we didn't win through uh, through being better. We didn't win by being stronger and we didn't win by being smarter. We won by using collective knowledge through free trade. And OK, if, yes. In, in, in the grand scheme of so, evolutionary so, biology. Yes. But like in a fight, you're telling me. That that we couldn't have taken a, a Neanderthal, but we don't. But, but Brian, we say we didn't win by being smarter. We we, we got to qualify what we mean by smarter, though, because there are different kinds of smart. Right. Okay. We'll we'll say like reason. He wasn't the we. They weren't the weasel smart. That's all right. That exactly. Really- they were more like Gary smart, is what I'm saying. But but they spent all their time thinking like, man, Neanderthals are so awesome. <laughs> They're so handsome. They got that prominent brow. Like I think if it were like a judo fight, because Neanderthals had wide help pelvises low to the ground, if like it was like, all right, you got to start off with contact. I think Neanderthal would like probably just clean our clock. Well, I mean, but if it's like you getting in, you just throwing some punches and stuff, and keeping at, and you got stamina. Remember, we so, have bigger. We have like humans have like the best stamina stamina of like any animal there is. Okay, so I'll I'll say this much. First of all, uh, whatever wins in just one fight, it's it it's hard to make that count because there's so much variance in humanity. Like, picture picking any random two humans and pitting them. That doesn't really say anything about, I mean, just about anything. No, that's what I was saying. Apex. That's why I asked apex versus random. Because if it was just a random thing, I would say, yeah, probably on average, maybe uh, Neanderthal would have the strength advantage and you just wouldn't be able to overcome that. But if you're going apex Neanderthal versus apex human, I feel like there's no What does that mean? Because, like, like... well, okay, well then that's, I mean, then you're cheating because if you're able to go apex, then you're able to take a random ass Neanderthal versus somebody who's super skilled in the art of Kung Fu. It's like, it's like, how do you divorce the, the greatest knowledge? Neanderthal warrior of all time versus Bruce our Lee. greatest human physical specimen? Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee. But Bruce Lee knows things that that Neanderthal can't know. That's why because I'm so- of his superior intellect, Brian. No, well, no, superior. But, right, but it's like, not it's, even. But your, your your point is that they were awesome at at uh, being st- stronger and smarter in in combat situations. So in let's general, say the greatest of all time, the get the, the Neanderthal that killed the most, ruthless efficiency. At what they did, or at least what the relative to the entire history of, of the Neanderthal race, that dude versus or lady uh, versus the ultimate human killing machine. But that's 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 the whole problem is that the ultimate human killing machine is doing so based on uh, generations of killing knowledge that has been passed down through effective communication and idea exchange, which none of which the Neanderthals get the benefit of. If we're talking about, I mean, I guess to make this fair, you'd have to kind of do some kind of mind wipe or something. If we're talking about just physically. never. All right, and and we'll we'll follow your rabbit hole. But I I hope that the check's clear from from the Neanderthal super pack. That's (laughs) higher. No, okay, okay. So here's the thing. If you say the apex, the problem is is that humanity has excelled so far beyond the Neanderthals that there's no we rock. there's no comparison. You could take just about you could take one of the three of us 
and what idiocy we know from having watched action movies would probably be able to take out a Neanderthal in an arena situation. I wouldn't put money situation. on any of us. All right, all right. Well, I'm dead. I would I'm say, waiting. I would say, I'll say for a I'd probably fact. say something like, uh, I'd try to think of something clever before I died, though. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say that you'd be better off comparing a, a human of that era to a Neanderthal of that era. I, I, I think this apex setup is, is bad news. I, I like the idea of, of, of Brian taking us and putting us with our TV knowledge of martial arts versus, you know. <laughs> <laughs> First thing we do is try to appear larger. We're just like, ah! <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, despite whatever martial arts experiences we may have, I know we've all probably spent a lot more time watching professional wrestling, which may oh, yeah. impress the Neanderthal. Dude, we start flopping around. We do flips Ooh. and then land on our back. We're like, oh! No, dude, I would just cut a crazy promo right in his face. <laughs> yeah, you in it all! I'll tell you what, this Sunday, Miami <laughs> Arena, you're going down over the top rope. I'm going to take your mono brow ugg and hide behind your back. <laughs> You're like, it does not matter what the Neanderthal thinks. You were yeah. extinct 20 million years ago. 20,000 years ago. Right. How long ago? If you smell what the <laughs> dominant species has evolved to. Oh, wait. Do you have fire? <laughs> so sorry. They, they did. Yeah, they had fire. I was about to say. That's that. That's that. That's that's Neanderthalist. We're exaggerating, Brian. It's yeah. Tesla. All right, all right. So I don't know where where do you come down on it? I mean I guess you know the answer. What does your gut tell you though, Andrew? Uh, I I, I think that uh, you know the the average. If if we figure you know yeah, it's hard to figure out like what is the average? What's the median? Even even within a group of let's say like you know eighty or so Homo sapiens at that point, you're they're all going to be they're going to be much more athletic than probably us. That's for sure. Uh, and there's going to have been some you know, Darwinian things going on as far as, you know, child infant mortality, whatever. So they're going to be, they're going to be on average stronger than us, uh, much more stamina than we have. And I guess, you know, having been in similar environments as Neanderthals, if we compare somebody back then, I, I, I think that, you know, each one would learn how to fight to their own advantages. And, you know, one of the things that, that we, and I've said this before and we, we, it kind of gets forgotten is human beings have incredible amounts of stamina. We can over a distance outrun a horse. Not me personally, maybe Brian when he's in the middle of training or something, or Justin when he's on his jogging kick, but a human can outrun a horse over distance and we can tire out a lot of animals. And that's one of the ways in which we would hunt is we would just get up and start running and chasing these things down. And then finally these big beasts would be like, <clears throat> have heart attacks and fall over. Yeah. But, but do you think, do you think the battle, I think a great Nike ad, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> do you think do you think the battle would really go for like days to the point? I mean, it seems like they would be decided way earlier. Boxing match, you know, big powerful fighters often tire very early. You had a you know a guy like Muhammad Ali, who you know was a, a a faster guy with a lot of with a lot of stamina, and arguably probably one of the greatest fighters ever. Yeah, and, and some of our biggest best fighters. George Foreman. Think, yeah, what's that? Rope a dope told uh, George Foreman. Uh, exactly. Uh, heavier some fighter, of our greatest fighters fighter. generally have been guys who have been, you know, not not the bulkiest or the strongest, but sometimes more compact, more sleek, and have maybe reach advantages and other advantages. So I don't know. I really don't know. I'll when tell it, you what. I put up Tom Hardy from Warrior. That dude is a beast. I put up, uh, wait, Tom Hardy. Wasn't that the name of Bane? Yeah. You ever see that movie he was in, Warrior? The yeah. MMA movie? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll put him as Bane against him. <laughs> I'll put him what? against him. <laughs> I'm great. Are we picking incarnations of Tom Hardy to pit against Are we now going to do a, are, are we going to do a, a, uh, a, a tournament? The, the, the tournament <laughs> yes, of Hardys? Of all Tom Hardys. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and then the guy from Inception comes in. <laughs> right. <laughs> Dude, Eames, Eames is going out first round. Eames doesn't make it fast. They're being uh, accepted. Oh, wait. What if he did? What if he put in the idea like, you know, it'd be awesome is failing at this tournament and he got into their dreams. So, all right. So you're saying, all right, Eames versus Charlie Bronson first round. You think, I mean, I don't know. Charlie Bronson's, I don't know if I want to get into Charlie Bronson's dreams. I don't know if Charlie Bronson knows the difference between a dream state and reality. Yeah. <laughs> I've got nothing. 
Yeah. I'll tell you uh, what. If you would like to make your suggestions for first round matchups for the the the, the tournament of Hardies, please. It's go a ahead case of cat scratch fever. <laughs> Come on, I got the right animal. <laughs> that was great. It was very well done. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to remind you that the Dolls of Lisbon is on DVD and available for download. 100 handmade dolls shipped around the world. Arts and crafts meets subversion. It's a DIY eyeball-busting bonanza. Film Threat gave it three and a half stars. So go on. Uh, find it via Google. You know, go to Amazon. Type it up. The Dolls of Lisbon, available now. For DVD and download whatever you choose. Thank you to Ethan Minsker, who bought that ad read. Very cool. I like. I love the idea that you know we're getting people doing some alternative culture kind of stuff, film stuff, all that bands. That's great. I think our audience is. Uh, I love the fact that there exists art that is so out there that the first place they think to spend their money is to advertise it on weird things. I think it's, yeah, it's awesome. I love the fact that we can be, you know, we can be a poster board for which these kind of things get uh, get get put up for everybody to listen to and, and read and watch. Very cool. So I'm reading this, checking this out on film. It looks very interesting. Gentlemen. What's up? Got one more story for you. Go ahead. Good. I mean, I got a billion stories, but. I'm can I, can I actually, I, I got, I actually, if we want to get another perspective, I have someone here in the studio with me who might be able to offer, I feel like the. A her, Neanderthal? Well, no. Don't who, let her would do. she, would she beat a Neanderthal? Oh, she would beat a Neanderthal for sure. But I'll tell you what, we've never. Can I thank her for laughing at my Nike joke <laughs> on mic? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying what we should have is the perspective of a human being current, currently engaged with a large symbiote inside her belly. Uh, sure. You, Bonnie, Are you going to introduce it? No, apparently, apparently not. Apparently. Hold on. There we go. All right. Go ahead. I never saw him turn the mic on, so. I didn't, I didn't turn <laughs> the mic on because you were all acting like you didn't want to have the mic on. But then, then I decided I was going to bring you in. Hi, Bonnie. Hi, I'm pregnant and tired. <laughs> Hi. I'll tell you what, that's Hi. the kind of high energy introduction we're looking for here on the I Weird Things know. Podcast. All right, we're gonna Bonnie, we're gonna play a lightning round and you're you're critical to this, all right? All right, this is good. Okay. Yes. <laughs> all right. Uh I'm gonna give you initials of a man and uh I'm gonna tell you uh, I'm gonna give you his initials are JK. And it's going to be a question of what made this guy special. Um, and I'm going to give you the day he died. But if you want to start going, what makes this guy special? You can start asking me yes or no questions. Okay. Uh, is he dead? Oh, wait, sorry, you already said. Is he, he dead he... today? <laughs> was he also dead? He died dead? in 1973. Will he be dead tomorrow? Uh, was he involved in I'm politics? I'm sorry, that is incorrect. <laughs> that is not when he died. Um, <laughs> let me, uh, I, I was trying was to pull up a, uh, another fact Was his name Joey Knowledge Is there a Jerry Knowles or something like that? Jerry Knowledgeman. Hi, it's me, four-time Spelly B champ Joey Knowledgeman. He says Spelly yeah, I think He probably died, I think, in the 1950s, late 1950s. 1950s. It was uh, my first question. Was it Joey Knowledgeman? <laughs> oh, go right. Come on, Brian. You're wasting. Okay. Uh, did he, wait, did he die in the 70s or in the 50s? 50s. He died, I believed, in the 50s. Oh, 50s. Okay. Uh, did he have a remarkable memory? Uh, not a, not a, a, a super exceptional memory that what, to my did knowledge. He have, did he have a beautiful mind? Sub question. He did. <laughs> he did. His memory was very good up until he died though. I'll say that. All right. Was uh, he, a, if, if he didn't have a beautiful mind, do you think he would enjoy the film? A beautiful mind starring. <laughs> was, uh, uh, I, I'm just going to skip right over that. Uh, was, <laughs> Uh, did he have move. did he have a remarkable talent of some variety something no. that would be really mm. wait no. you said no well uh did he die a rich man not that i'm aware of was it 
John F. Kennedy. No. Are you sure? You might want to double check that. He died sometime close to that time. <laughs> oh okay. Did um did he live a long life? Did he live longer yes. than the average life expectancy? Yes. Wait, is that did, did he is live that over he 150, was... 20 years? 120 years? No. 110 years? No, I don't believe so. 100 years. Okay. Um, was he... Did he witness something very extraordinary? <laughs> yes. Hmm. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Hey. I think this has to do with something in astronomy. In astronomy? Yeah. Was this the guy who saw like uh, an astronomical event of significance? No. Oh. Hold on, body. Maybe, maybe he's just misinterpreting. <laughs> oh, let me go to bat for you. Are you sure? Because like Halley's comment counts as astronomical. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I don't know if he saw that, but no, I mean, no, okay. it wasn't he significant have, that he that saw wasn't. it. <laughs> Did he start a school for gifted mutants? Yes, <laughs> but it has nothing to do with this. Uh, it, uh, did uh, did he witness something that we would consider to be violent? Yes. Hmm. Was, did he witness something that changed the course of American history? Yes. Did did he used to own a black person? All right, Brian. <laughs> I'm just saying, this got Civil War vet written all over it. Was he? Was, did he live to see the Civil War? I I do believe I know what our friend is is known for. Really? Okay. Well, uh, are you gonna rec are you gonna recuse yourself or go for it? Oh, if you're gonna give me the option of letting you dangle, yes, I'm <laughs> up. No, I'll keep I'll keep going. Like like like, did he have something to do with the Civil War? He was alive during part of it. Did did he fight in it? Participate in any way? No. Mm. Gold rush? No. Assassination of Lincoln? Yeah. What? <laughs> oh my when god! He was when Mister uh, Samuel James Seymour was five years old. His godmother said, "You know what, Sammy? You need some culture. I'm going to take you to a play." He didn't want to go see our American cousin. No. But she decided he should see it anyways. He Five-year-old Sammy J. Seymour was in the balcony the night Lincoln got shot. Was that was that what you were going to say, Justin? Uh, it was, because as soon as we were going through this, I had seen a clip that started circulating last week of uh, him on, what was, was it, was it uh, to tell the truth? Or, uh, no, I've got a secret. I, yeah, he was on. So he's on video from 1956 on "I've Got a Secret," and that was his secret that he saw Abraham Lincoln getting shot. Oh my God! And by the way, like that, it, that's an amazing thing. And like that headline makes you watch the clip, but the clip itself is so anticlimactic because like the people there get it in like three guesses. It's like it's like like oh, uh, was it political? Yes. Was it violent? Yes. Did you watch Lincoln get shot? Yes. <laughs> So, okay, what would that have been in 1956? Uh, that would have been, what, 70 years after the fact, right? So that would be roughly the equivalent of... No, no, I was 90 years after the fact. Yeah. yeah. 90 years after five. the fact? He was five. And he's, he's 90, very, very 95 frail. at that point? And uh, he so what is would, what offered would this be? or is given a carton of cigarettes at the end. Okay, so so what would the equivalent... They event gave five -year -old cigarettes? for someone nowadays. You got a 95 year old guy on television, and they say, uh, so that would have been what, 1970? Titanic? 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 Yeah. That'd be like, that'd be, he's on to tell the truth. No, uh, that'd, be, that'd be more, right? Because, well, Titanic was 19, what? 12. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that would be 100 years. So he, uh, I guess it would be even more recent than the Titanic. He was like, I watched the Grapes of Wrath get written. <laughs> yes. I don't, I don't, I actually don't know when that happened. Well, and what makes it kind of fascinating is the idea that you have a guy that witnessed an event when photography was relatively new. Yeah, you know, an amazing historical event. The country's less than a hundred years old, living long enough to tell that story on television. 
that can then end up on YouTube. So you can watch a guy that was in Ford's theater the night Lincoln was shot. It's I mean, amazing. It's wow. an amazing thought. So it just these these different periods of history, which seem so separated, but this bridge, you know, of TV in the 1950s to YouTube. So I guess maybe maybe somebody who saw like Archduke Franz Ferdinand get shot. Yeah, that ooh, be, that'd be a good one. Good one. Yeah. So they had reality TV in the 50s. Apparently, I mean they they no, called it was game yeah it was it was a quiz show. Time. It's a quiz show. It's a game show, yeah. Yeah, where they'd have someone go on who has a secret, right. and they'd, they'd investigate and figure out what. Where, by the way, everybody was smoking constantly. Yes. That's my favorite part so of old television. Funny. It's just like ashtrays somewhere. everywhere. It's like, yeah, yeah, we're filming a show, whatever. Blowing butts. <laughs> Man, I want to bring that back. Can we all start smoking no. on Philip weird Philip Morris things? presents disgusting. the Children's Cartoon Hour. <laughs> it's so disgusting. Like, I look at people who are old with their teeth and you just know immediately if they're smokers and i'm like I'm so well, no, but like, like mad men they all smoke like herbal cigarettes or whatever that like i heard real. a great example you know where mad men is alive and well china mm. oh sure <laughs> yeah <laughs> the the misogyny the he's like the like smoking. oh my god like like uh i really i love watching mad men because it transports me back to a period that i so long for <laughs> china bro it's happening yeah. right now the future's real <laughs> Right. Oh, I think. No, only anyhow, uh, Sam, Samuel <laughs> James Seymour. So check it out. So that, that, that should be, by the way, China, where the past comes alive. <laughs> do we have any other uh, reads? Uh, we certainly do. Andrew Dale says, "Movember, please support this great a worldwide male awareness charity. Please go ahead and visit w or sorry http colon slash slash mobro dot co slash andy j dale or just at the abductee on Twitter to see Andy supporting a popular Weird Things podcast character's mustache. So, uh, so of course, Movember. If you're not familiar, it's the uh, Month where uh, you are suggested to wear a a man's mustache uh, to uh, raise I I forget what exactly the the cause awareness. Of well, I I mean unfortunately, sadly, it would be to raise awareness for for cancer, which uh, yeah. apparently uh, think, apparently it, it, hasn't it, worked it, out. It, so it's well. testicular cancer, right? Uh oh, I actually don't know that about. I, I believe I believe where, that's what it is. Anyway, so go to mobro dot co slash Andy J Dale. Uh, and uh, visit the at the abductee, which I mean, I love the fact that there is somebody who wants to spend their own hard earned money to get the word out to uh, spread uh, the, the the good news on a amazing charity. And their Twitter handle is at the abductee. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Gentlemen, I think it's time we do picks. Uh, I'm going to go up front with a short one because I think we're going to have a longer discussion. Yeah. So. My quick pick, if you're looking for a good audio book or book to read, uh, Penny Marshall, My Mother is Nuts. Uh, Penny Marshall, you may remember her as Laverne from Laverne and Shirley. Mm -hmm. And uh, very much enjoyed it. Very funny. I think I mentioned before she did some pod smodcasts with Kevin Smith on the Movie Maker podcast. I'll tell you what. I, like you, came to those long after the fact. Like, I saw them in the feed, and it was one of those things I'll get around to doing. And, uh, and I just dove in and... It, they were amazing. It, it it just sounds like a different time, a different era where everything is just there and nobody knows the value of having a nationwide audience at the time. And that yeah. just, you know, deciding I don't feel like doing stenography. So I guess I'll become a famous international personality. And then and then like now I guess I'll be the first female director to direct a movie that grosses over a hundred million dollars. It's just this nonchalance about it. That's amazing she's, and inspiring. It, she's got a great perspective. And, and you know, if any of you ever watched Laverne and Shirley growing up or watching reruns or whatever, you know what, how great comedically she was. You know, she's very much, you know, that was a show that was sort of modeled in the, uh, the Lucille Ball sort of comedy, you know, 30, 20 years later or so. But uh, very enjoyable. I, I absolutely, she's got great stories, got a great perspective. She's a person that's been involved in the careers of so many other people. There's another Smodcast with interviews with John Lovett to Saturday Night Live, and you find out about how many people ended up on Saturday Night Live or because Lorne Michaels asked Penny Marshall, what do you think about so and such? She's like, oh, yeah, I like him. He's a nice guy staying in my house. You know, and she's 
one of these people in LA has had this house where the number of famous people that have slept on her couch and lived there. Richard Dreyfus spent, you know, was you know, she has in her autobiography she tells a story about how when she and Rob Reiner were breaking up, they took six months longer to do it because Richard Dreyfus wouldn't stop crying. <laughs> <laughs> he was living there and didn't like the idea that they were going to break apart. Albert Brooks would like spent three months on their couch doing nothing, and it was just this very interesting. You know, this this person who's right in the middle of everything, not by trying hard to be the center of it. You know, her brother was Gary Marshall. And, you know, when she was decided to go out to L.A. and she she gets these jobs first, in you know, acting roles where it'd say like homely girl says, you know, and, and yeah. you know, she'd read that in a script and you just you know, tear her apart. But she just kept at it and she's just so likable. So uh, it's on Audible. My Mother is Nuts by Penny Marshall. Did you read it? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and actually, awesome. I I would say like a uh, an additional plug. Uh, if, if you're not sure if you're gonna like the book and you want to essentially get a piece of the character for free, definitely, definitely listen to the Smoothie Makers episodes with her and Kevin Smith. Uh, Kevin Smith, I think, is extraordinarily undervalued as an interviewer. He has a really good job of matching the personality uh, and uh, you know the the beats of the person that he's dealing with, and he brought to life the story of Penny Marshall in a way that I never thought that, that I would experience and certainly has made me interested in the story as well. Uh, it's that was listening to that, those episodes at three episodes. I, I listened to them on the way back down from Orlando and I said, I, I want to hear more of her stories. It's just, I love showbiz stories. I love, I don't read magic books. I read like showbiz books and you know, this is, you know, great example of, you know, the kind of stuff I love to hear. Brian, do you want to go with your pick? Yeah. Uh, you remember like last week, or two weeks ago, because we took a week off, which, uh, by the way, I'm sorry, on behalf of all three of us, if it were up to us, circumstances would never have made that a situation. But uh, you remember I was reading uh, Stephen Pinker's uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature? Yes. And uh, I, I liked it a lot of the, of the trifecta between the rational optimist, abundance, and this book. This book, while probably made the most compelling case made me the saddest because there's no way to tell the story about how much better we are as a society now, how much less violent we are as a society now without graphically describing what life was like a hundred years ago, 200 years ago, 500 years ago. And when you have vivid descriptions of what it means to be broken on the wheel um, in, in which if, if you didn't know, and I didn't know, that means they, they, one of the tortures they would do is they'd throw somebody on a wagon wheel. They'd break their arms in enough pieces that they could weave the destroyed flesh hands through the spokes of the wheel. Uh, and then people would, for their amusement, go and look at the, at the, I mean, it just, it just made me sad. I mean, I mean, in, which is bizarre for, for what should be a very inspiring message uh, was uh, the graphic depictions just really bummed me out. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write that one down as a very important book. And after you've read The Rational Optimist and after you've read uh, Abundance, you should definitely read this because you ne- it's important to realize that something magical in the entire history of mankind is happening right now. And he even talks about how difficult it is for scientists to not want to describe what's happening in the last uh, several hundred years as as something divine or, or you know something to ascribe almost a religious meaning to the fact that, that we've become so much less violent but it's it's inspiring in many re- regards but man you have to hear some horrific descriptions of what people did for grins back in the old days there were there was things like people would crowd into a theater to watch a cat be lowered on a brazier into a burning, uh, a, a burning bonfire so that they could laugh at the way it would freak out and eventually get burned alive. I mean, oh, it was, it was rough. It was rough. But Man, life before cable TV. Exactly, right? And and so, uh, and he gives very good reasons and very compelling arguments for why things have changed. And uh, um, it, yeah, it's way good. Uh, but now I'm reading, uh, I believe it's Kahneman is the author of the book, uh, Thinking fast and slow and this this came to us over twitter from uh, uber moogle i don't know if you remember but a couple weeks ago i was talking about how weird it is that there are things i can do 
with different parts of my body. Like the happiest I am is, is when I'm at the gym working out on the elliptical because my body's doing something and I'm listening to an audio book while also playing this video game Drop 7 that involves manipulating colors and numbers to, to make uh, uh, to basically stay alive as long as you can. And uh, Uber Moogle sent a tweet saying that that's essentially what thinking fast and slow is all about. And uh, thinking fast and slow has been really good the first part. Uh, the, the overall thesis is that you essentially have kind of two systems run in your brain. And as much as we like to think of ourselves as, oh, I'm the person in charge of this ship and th there's a single me, uh, very clearly through a number of exercises, he sets up a number of problems where you think about it two different ways. You think about what your gut tells you, and it's a very consistent result. Uh, and you think about what your what we think of as our rational mind uh, takes you through, and you realize how many of the very important decisions we make day to day are made by this intuitive system where there's no conscious rational thought whatsoever it's it's as though we have two warring personalities in our mind and one of them is just not even able to handle important computations and uh uh it's i i'm really enjoying it really looking forward to seeing where it goes with it but thinking fast and slow i'm enjoying it a lot cool um my pick is the film cloud atlas uh Directed by uh, Triker and then the, the Wachowski siblings. Um, now, no, I don't know. I don't want to say no one, but I was very, very cynical about this movie going into it from oh the first my God. trailer. Were you ever? From um, I, in the movie, I don't know how much of that was gamesmanship, but you were not shy during the, the winter movie draft about, about how poorly this movie would do. And for the record, you were right, and I'm sad I bought it. Yeah, well, I, 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 I still didn't think it was going to make any money. I mean, no matter what I, I thought of the film as, as artistically, you know. Um, but I saw it today on the recommendation. I had a conversation with Andrew on on Sunday, and I went to go see it today before the podcast. And I have to say, uh, it was really, really uh, awesome to see a good Wachowski <laughs> siblings movie, like. It was like it was a a movie that I had been waiting. I think to a, to a large extent, kind of we have all been waiting for since the first Matrix. And that's not to say that it has anything to do with the Matrix or even hits many of the same notes as the Matrix. Although you could say that you know thematically, it's a movie that uh, you know makes a lot of big points or or has these big symbolic kind of elements that may or may not be you know uh, the smartest things in the world, but. It's super competently told. The action's fantastic. And let me just say this. I love the sound design on the laser guns. That, I think that was like my favorite part of the movie was that like, you know, because we, we've tended to go to these very almost realistic laser gun sounds in movies because nobody wants to do like the pew pew. But they have like an, an awesome sound. I don't know. I don't know why it stuck with I, me, but for some reason. I like the lasers too. The way they, it was different than kind of like the way they were. It's kind of like a mixture of like sparkles or something and you know yeah but it had like this like this semi-automatic fire element mm -hmm. to it uh that was that was really cool to to summarize the movie it would be impossible it's just it, it, it's all these crazy moving parts i haven't in full disclosure i haven't read the book i don't know how it stacks up to the book i know some people that read the book were a little upset that some of the recurring actors including hugo weaving and halle berry and uh tom hanks uh, don't play the same characters as they move through uh, through time and history, I guess, uh, compared to the books. So I, I don't, I can't speak to that. I can speak to the fact that, like, I, I forgot just how much I thought of the the Wachowskis um, as this kind of this lost cause that they were just, you know, they made the Matrix and the Matrix was a fluke, and they were just going to keep making really dumb movies forever. And, um, you know, I was, I was happy. It was one of those things where like, I felt like I saw an old friend again. I, I saw it Friday with my dad. And when I saw the trailers, I remember going, I was cynical because it just looked like it was going to be an all over the kind of play story. Uh, 
I didn't have a lot of confidence. That, I mean, remember the last Wachowski film, what that they directed was Speed Racer. Mm -hmm. And then before that, they had, you know, the, the two Matrix sequels, which I'm not too high up on. But I, I went into it with, you know, kind of, no expectation other than, you know, it, it, you know, at very least I'll get to watch, you know, Hanks and Halle Berry and all them play the different characters and just to see how they did it. And technically, I thought they did a great job. I mean, they're telling there's like six different storylines or multiple storylines that are woven together that were done. I was interested in every single one. I was very, very interested in the characters and the outcome. And it's not necessarily like I use Whale Rider as an example. Whale Rider, I thought it was a great film. I don't really believe in that mythology. I don't really believe the whales are these magical creatures, et cetera. Um, but in the co context of the story, I liked it. I very much enjoyed Whale Rider. It's a religious film, just like The Passion. But, you know, each one in their own sort of, you know, environments work. And that's what I thought about this, is that I don't, I don't think the movie's really that deep, you know, as perhaps the Wachowskis feel that it is. But it, it's, it's, it's every bit or more passionate than yeah, that. But, and but that's all that I, mean, I want to see. The Matrix had the same thing to it yeah where you know and, and, and some, the matrix some fell could read apart into and sequels. you could make the argument that they believed the matrix was a very very deep message when you know that's not exactly why people loved and, it and, and and the sequels fell apart when they tried to just lean in put too much of it upon that sort of thing where this was just this hey this is you know it's, it's like a love song that somebody's going to tell you a story or a music video about love or humanity and whatever and and, and, and it's a perspective, but I thought it was a well-crafted story, a very interesting – I saw it once. I look forward to seeing it again. It's not for everybody, and the, the way they, they took what I would think would be an unfilmable story and tied it all together with the beginning, middle, and the end, the audience I was with very much loved it, enjoyed it, applauded at certain points, and this is a mainstream audience. So, uh, yeah, I don't think it's going to do great theatrically, but I do think it's going to be a movie that's going to grow with time and people are going to really appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, and so uh, uh, I, I I am somebody who's very criticism averse. Like if I'm kind of thinking about seeing something, it only takes one person to tell me that it sucked, and I'm like, well, I don't know that I want to risk three hours looking at something that I'm not going to love. Uh, and Tom Merritt sort of bummed me out by saying it was almost a great movie, and instead, like he didn't say what it was. Like he just felt like it was incomplete, and it was sh it fell short of. Of the things, uh, the other the other iteration I heard was uh, the the trailer. Of course, at over five minutes long, was like an epic trailer selling the movie. But the movie itself plays like an epic trailer selling something that you don't quite get to see. I, is, I don't know. Is there I anything agree to with that? The second thing, I mean, to to Tom to a uh, gun, the, you know, that fast talking, gum snapping Hollywood Tom Merritt's yeah criticism. Hollywood Tom Merritt uh, as we call him on frame rate. You know, uh, I, I I don't know. I mean, I would guess I mean, like, he has a different perspective because he read the book. He just read the book recently for Sword and Laser. So uh, I, I don't I don't know how much of that factors into to how we would look at the at the movie. Having now read the book, I, I, I always especially when when you're talking about movies relative to other films, I, I always kind of take the the gymnastics judging kind of approach to it. How much risk did you take in in your inherent premise, and then how well did you execute on it? So you, you know, get so points for like, difficulty, basically. Yeah. A movie like Inception, a $200 million action thing with, a, with a, a premise that's going to be incredibly hard for a mass audience to understand and is deliberately obscured, that's a tremendous risk executed on brilliantly, which is why Inception is probably my favorite Christopher Nolan movie. This movie, there's, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that is not even for, like, sci-fi people, like... You know that one of the things is is set. You know, and I don't I don't know if it's a spoiler to say when in time it is well, set. But it, like, if you've seen it, the trailers, you, you, it looks like you've got colonial era stuff. It looks like you got 1970s. It looks like okay, you got but there's some there's the like some far sci-fi stuff that's like challenging, like challenging to understand what they're saying. You know, like to to the point where they want to build this world and uh, you know build this kind of universe in, in a very literary kind of way and uh i think they do it successfully in the context of this larger story i i would add to that i think that there are there are some science fiction movies and when they come out you know they they i'd say they're misjudged but they're judged within that sort of frame of time and then afterward and sometimes and i don't know that cloud house will be one of them but it could be you take blade runner when blade runner came sure. out Box office failure. It was considered, you know, you know, the the flaws were very evident in that film. So much so that people, 
didn't see how much was amazing about that film. And it's one of those things that as time's grown on, Blade Runner is one of the most beloved science fiction films. And people still get into that going, nah, I didn't like it. I didn't this. And then sometimes it grows on people. Sometimes it doesn't. But, you know, they keep bringing it out because Blade Runner is an amazing film, flaws and all. And I think that, you know, that may be the case, you know, Cloud Atlas may be a movie that gets forgotten or maybe a film that, you know, when you look at the idea, the narrative structure of, you know, those six stories, which is a literary structure that's done a lot in literary, you know, in with in books. This is uh, what you're doing is brilliant because you guys just reframed this entire thing to me. This is not a risky proposal in which I may lose three hours of my time and get a crappy movie in return. This is a risky proposal in that if I don't see this, I may be that asshole who who missed out on seeing a 2001 while it was in theaters or a a Blade Runner. And, you know, in context, Brian, I've been watching 2001 you know, every night before I go to sleep and I keep falling asleep watching it. Really? And I love because Kubrick. Keep in mind, like I, I no lie. Uh, I before I finally sat through all of Blade Runner conscious, I fell asleep to it six times before before actually finishing the entire movie. Yeah, I've watched, I've watched, you know, I've watched 2001 dozens of times. I'm a big Kubrick fan. I've got books on it, but you know, I'm sitting back and I'm like, oh, I haven't watched that movie in probably three or four years. Let me sit down and watch it. And it's the point where I'm kind of tired at night. But it's just, it's that kind of because of the pacing in that movie, I keep zoning out doesn't mean it's not a great film i think it is and i and i can def- but you know i'm so used to what makes it great now and this and that and you know it can point out oh this is the significance of moon watcher and all these little points though but it it, it becomes sort of a background noise almost to a point do, do, oh. uh, real quick if you want 2001 to be background noise and i don't know if justin will disagree with me on this but uh check out bowie2001.com it's uh it's uh pieces of 2001 uh chopped up with remixes of David Bowie songs and it does everything out of order. And it's just, it's got each song has its own little texture. And I, uh, I, I've watched it several times. I, I may at this point have watched it more than I watched the original 2001. I like it quite a bit. So, but yeah, I think that was a good point bringing that up. And then, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, it, it's time is the only thing that will tell us what happens with this. And, and I, I walked out of there enjoying it and hoping for, Gosh, I hope there is an extended version because I would love to watch this several nights in a row, which is you know not a fault of the filmmakers. It's a fault of the medium itself that, you know, if you start going past, you know, it's, it's like two hours, 44 minutes. Once you hit that three hour mark, it's long. I mean, yeah. it, it's I there, there's, there's, a, there's it, a point in which uh, you kind of the story is kind of hit a little bit of a crescendo and then you realize that it's just a kind of another gear shifting for now the final kind of uh you know dominoes to fall that i kind of felt a little bit of the, of, of, of the length but that being said i mean if you like the idea of i mean if you you know uh, are a storyteller yourself if you enjoy storytelling i think this is i mean it really is an achievement and and, and you know to get back to kind of the the promise of of the wachowskis you know that you know that i don't know if, if expectations have really ever been higher after a first film than than uh you know the the Wachowskis were after the Matrix. But well, you know Bound, people but... looked at them what was that? Bound was their first film. Okay. Well then uh, after their first uh, big know, hit. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um Affleck was the bomb in Phantoms though. Sure. Uh so uh but I mean like people didn't look at them as just good directors. They look at that they looked at them as like like directors of their age, you know, and I think that was kind of what and and be it media, you know, contrived. Uh, I I believe that was what kind of people looked at them as. And this was the first time that I watched a movie of theirs and said like, oh, that's why we thought that about those guys. Well, and it was, I mean, that was the the major thing was because Bound was an art house film that was a very very popular film, very good film, and then they yeah. went from Bound to doing Matrix, which was this popcorn flick and they went from art house to popcorn flick then all of a sudden boom they blew up and you know what went from art house favorites to there and then you know as you point out after that it was like oh you know is that all they got but i i would say that this is a very interesting melding of you know those two universes yeah so great stuff cloud atlas uh you know i'm curious to see you know people comment on on the uh on, on the on the post uh here on weird things when it goes up to see what the point of view of people is uh, people are who, who read the book but you know as just a movie like and and again 
I was all too excited to poop on this film. And by poop on it, I mean not see it and just make fun of it. Um, but I was, I was blown away. I was suckered. I, I, I fell for the power of love here in Cloud Atlas. <laughs> It was, you know, it the, was uh, great stuff. Just the, the Rotten Tomatoes, the audience score is 77% right now. Fresh. Yep, which is good. The uh, the uh, the tomatometer for critics is 63. And you look at the critics which, and which, you see— Which, by the way, to put that in perspective, uh, keep in mind, at the time of release, Fight Club was 65% in, and was, was certified as, as rotten at the time. And only after, like years after Fight Club, if you go now, it'll show it as much, much more positive as, as more reviews come out seeing it in context for its time. Like, to me, like, weirdly— those are the movies I'm most excited to see are the ones that are right on the edge that that polarize audiences that are uncomfortable enough that they push a lot of people to uh, to say negative things about it. Totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah, man. Cloud Atlas. Go, go well, get it in your life. Well, gentlemen, it's been weird. Has it? Like a cat. Meow. With six toes. <laughs> Scratching you. Cat scratch fever. Wow. Right, Can I guys? have some scratch? <laughs> the weasel. Uh, now I'll tell you what. Uh, the one thing, maybe I, I don't know if I want to say this. Uh, the, the 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 valley people jargon kind of kind of got to me. If there's one thing that I could have I could have you know dealt with dialed down just a little bit was the was was the valley people jargon. Well, that's the true true, Justin. Uh, it, it certainly is the true true. <laughs> See, and, um, well, and I, I don't know specifically what you're talking about, but I assume that there's some kind of, uh, you know, future slang that gets a used. Patois. It is. Yeah. It is. Um, uh, to be honest, that's the way it's going to be. Like, like, by definition, we will find the way people speak in 40 years horrific and annoying. Like, that's why they talk that way. Disagree. Really? Absolutely. Yeah. I, we our speech since the advent of television has not English speech really hasn't changed much at all. Lies. Total lies. Go back to watch anything, any movie in the 1940s. Any anything in the the the, the, the cadence, the way What did I say? Since television. It's television in the 1950s. Okay. Uh even in the 1950s though, I'm going to say Uh yeah, man. Uh look, I remember Okay, all right. 1993 being annoyed with the introduction of the phrase, what's up with that? I'm like, that is the dumbest phrase I've ever heard. And it's those little moments like that, that, that we can't see now that will come to us that we will think are dumb until all of a sudden we're saying them. All right. Can I, can I say something? Yes. I, there are places now in the world where I find how people speak to be stupid or annoying, and I don't want to listen to it as much as I would want to listen to other dialects. So, I mean, it's not necessarily like, I, I understand why they did it in the context of the movie. They want to show that, that, you know, this is a, a, you know, a radically different era that is both the future and the past at the same time. And, and, you know, adds to the cyclical nature of our story, but like at the same time, it was just kind of, and, and really, you even though I was actively annoyed by it, I was still engrossed in in that specific story. Although I would say it was probably my least favorite of all the, you're, the different you're stories. You're always like. going to get uh, phrases or expressions that come about. But when you look at linguistic drift, it has slowed down dramatically because of television. And, and across country, you know, you go into deep, deep rural areas and, and you still get, you can't understand, or Pacific neighborhoods and you can't. But when you look at, when I you, television is a broadcast taught, you know, at that time, a hundred million people how people in New York or LA or Burbank talked, and then you started to see this drift right. towards okay. it. But I, I understand that. But flashback to 1990s and think about phrases that did not exist that we wouldn't blink twice about. Uh, stuff like uh, old school, that phrase did not exist just 22 years ago. Uh, uh, under the bus, threw them under the bus. That expression yeah, but, did not exist 22 years ago. But but there are, you know, you read a book written in the 50s and you find a lot of these little temporary expressions or terms that come about that fade away. Yeah, like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, you can see you, uh, there's there's discussions about where that trees from. I mean, the point is, is many of these things are very annoying when they come out mm -hmm. and then become very commonplace. And I could, uh, whatever it is that annoyed you, Justin, I could totally see 
uh, something that sounds annoying now being totally commonplace. Well, the, 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 the thing is the patois, which is a kind of a de-evolution of language, which I'm saying you don't, you don't, we're not as likely to get because the things that cause language drift aren't apparent, don't happen now. You, you get the patois because you get an isolated group of people that start reinforcing their own sort of things where here you have in a mass media culture, it's less likely. It's, it's why Hugh Grant sounds, you know, remarkably like, you know, an actor from Pasadena. Yeah. Even- I, I and again I haven't seen it so maybe we're talking different languages. I think we're kind of t- we're talking about two different things. Like well, in, in the patois. context of, of I mean, you know patois is the term you use to describe right you know yeah, right but, but, you know, but, Brian, I mean like it, in this movie specifically there are very large gigantic reasons why they are talking like this that isn't just like a, a evolution of you know like it's not like we like there are stories that are just several, you know, uh, decades in the future or, or a century in the future. And then there's this other story uh, that for which there a lot has happened. Let me just say that, like, they, that they do the language thing to illustrate just how far this culture has come and, you know, be it in the right or wrong direction. All right, I'll have to, I'll have to check it out. And, and, and to your part, Brian, they, they do have, like, there's two future stories. And the one before the, the, the later one, you get your annoying phrases in there. You have to sit back and think about what the hell she meant. And then you realize that, you know, uh, he like, you know, changed the world as alter reality. You know, I wasn't genome to alter reality. I wasn't born to save the world. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. Uh, but I'll tell you the one, the one thing I did really like about it is, is that it is, it is kind of a, a book for, for sci-fi book people, like you know, there's a lot of stuff that you don't normally see taken in in movies, where in terms of world building, especially when they have, you know, a real thumbnail, you know, to to kind of build these worlds, and they do them extraordinarily effectively, especially the future ones, you know, that the they don't we don't really see a ton. Obviously, we don't spend a ton of time with them, but in other movies that will either gloss over stuff or or kind of spoon feed us the world they do a lot of 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 show don't tell and and a lot of just letting you catch up with stuff which is which is great by the way uh bonnie since she sneaked out the door has since tweeted uh this me penny put your candle away it's bedtime penny oh <laughs> i'm 97 percent of the way through <laughs> uh even better to me as a as a sci-fi geek and dad is that the book she's reading is Ender's Shadow, the companion novel to Ender's <laughs> Game. Like, like I, I didn't read that until, I mean, I, it didn't come out until I was in my 20s. But like no I read, I, I read uh, Ender's Game when I was in high school, and she's, she's reading that. And it's amazing. I love that. 97% done, you know. It's a different world. And that, that, that's the, uh, you know, as, as to the evolution of language and your point. You know, children, how far? I need you to get 30, 33% through of Mice and Men. Well, and I'll tell you what, like, like as much as, as much as, and you're seeing it less now, but when the Kindle came out and you heard a bunch of chatter about, you know, oh, but I love the slightly acidic smell of text pages and X, Y, and Z or whatever, like confusing, loving the trappings of a thing for loving the thing itself. It's like Penelope will feel this deep, deep affinity with this bizarre, gray on on or you know black on gray background to her kindle like she's experiencing words worlds through this vehicle and that will define the aesthetics that she will adore forever i'll tell you what i bought a physical book last night and the only reason i did it was so uh i don't get yelled at on flights that I can't read my Kindle or my iPad. Something, something to uh, to to take you through that that because that I, I read minutes. through a hundred bullets. Like I saved because I knew I really liked a hundred bullets, and I would I was flying so much that I would just read those like on takeoffs and landings and and stuff where they told me I couldn't do other things. Yeah. Um. Somebody's asking if uh, Ender's Shadow is better than Ender's Game. Uh, I will say out of that entire series. Um, it's Ender's Game is the best. Ender's Shadow is just as good as Ender's Game. Wow. Uh, I, and I mean that sincerely. It's it's fantastic, and they do a lot of really clever things, and they manage to tell a totally different story that uh, uh that matches. You know, it, it's the perfect companion novel. Um, and then uh, 
next after that is you have the story of the Ender Shadow series, which takes place immediately after the uh, the bugger conflict, and then after that, then go read the stuff as Ender as an adult. That's the order. Xenocide and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, cool. all right, gang. I all might right. get that when I get my iPad Mini and read it on there. Are you Are you gonna get the iPad Mini? Yes. You know what? Out of that whole announcement, the thing that stuck with me the most is, son of a bitch, you mean there's an iPad? There's going to be an iPad that I don't have to use a different cable for? <laughs> yes. I'm like, yeah, I figured out if I was going to buy another cable, might as well just get the iPad mini. Um, I, uh... I, I'm curious the sm- the slightly smaller form factor because it's like it's different when you consume different. If I'm just reading web pages, I love my iPad. You know, when I'm sitting in there reading, I like sort of the small, like the one handed screen kind of thing. Um, I love the iOS ecosystem, so of course I'm biased there. But uh, you know, a lot of great options out there now. I mean, that's what's fantastic is that you know you can, you know, you can, for two hundred bucks you can get a very capable you know a Kindle Fire HD. You know, the Google Nexus tablets, there's a lot of stuff out there. And it's, it's a, you know, a lot, and these are much better produced than two or three hundred dollar devices used to be. Oh, my God. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, do you know, guys the, think that uh, Scott Forstall had a problem Google mapping his way? Uh, uh, so the screen door didn't hit his ass on the way out. You, you really think that's all just Google Maps hitting him in the butt? No, I think it's, it's there's there's been stories of. People not wanting to have meetings with him unless Tim Cook was present. Really? You know, the whole, you know, have you been following the whole skeuomorphic design controversy? No, go ahead. So you notice how some of your apps are beautifully and elegantly designed and some of them have faux leather stitching? Yep. You're like, why is there fake leather stitching here? And apparently that was Scott Forrestal who was an advocate of that. And some of that they said was Steve Jobs liked that. And, but, you know, when, you know, Steve Jobs' parting words were, you know, don't try to ask what I would do. And yeah, you know, when I open my Find My Friends app and there's you know, it's fake leather, I mean, it's like, drives it's, you nuts. I, I feel like I'm in a like, you know, a, a 70s cigar lounge, you know, and, uh, you know, you know, dimly lit and, you know, Barry Manilow is playing somewhere in the background. And, you know, I'm about, I've got a big like Gemini thing hanging on my necklace here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, it was, uh, it'll be, it'll be interesting, uh, to see where they go. But I mean, I think that obviously it it shows you how important iOS is to them and how important iOS is to get right to them that like, this is, I mean, it, this drives the bus in, in so many ways, uh, you know, to, if, if, you know, they always talk about legs of the chair, you know, if, if the iPhone and the iPad are two of the strongest, you know, still growing legs of your chair, like what do they have in common? This right. is this is the, the the blood that runs through them. Now Johnny Ive is gonna be in charge of basically everything from iOS to the devices. Should be curious. It's gonna new Wait. order's gonna play every time you start up your iPhone. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right, gentlemen. I am gonna call it an evening. Um I will be in Las Vegas in 12, uh, for, uh, I almost cursed, um, uh, 14 hours, 14 hours. I'll be, in uh, space. yeah, Bri, there might be a uh, schedule, Sandy related schedule kerfuffling from me, but I'll, I'll be in contact with you tonight. Uh, okay. Well, keep in mind if it's a schedule thing, then that affects my surprise because yes, I'm, which is why I, I just got a text about it. Like, are we talking later or earlier? I don't know. Okay. All right. I, let let I, me know. Let you let know, me know as soon as possible. Yes. Wait. Is thought? Sh- uh, hold on. I just got a message. Thought shots says, "I'm going to Vegas to see you." Are you? Are you really going to DevLearn? Thought shots, because that'd be awesome. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm actually uh, I I get to to give a oh that's amazing that'll be fantastic. Um, I'm giving a uh, keynote presentation at DevLearn, the e-learning conference, which is all about uh, for it's it's geared toward people who use electronic learning, whether it's um, uh, academic or professional. 
like uh, everything from, you know, internal systems to explain how certain equipment works and so on. It's, uh, uh, dude, I'm way, way excited. That's, that's amazing. All right. So anyway, that's what I'm up to. And, uh, I like the question that will Johnny Ive always live in a white room? Yes. Yes. He will. <laughs> it's like some Stanley Kubrick designed, you know, complex at the, at Apple. They don't let him out of, you know, they like, they took away his passport. <laughs> I'm not positive that he's not, that he is not the white room. That he just manifests in the middle of it when he needs to uh, speak the language of humans. Yes, exactly. It's it's like uh, he he is an entirely artificial being, but in order to allow us to re- to relate with him, he creates this avatar that lives in white space <laughs> and DJs. <laughs> exactly. All right, uh, I'm gonna shut down the live feed. I love you guys. Have a good one. Bye 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 bye.